What we're going to be talking about today is the interurban, which, as you may know, starts right here, uh, officially, that's the trail trail, goes all the way up to um, 145th, though it turns into a bike lane uh, at 128th, and then it goes into Shoreline as a trail again, follows the old interurban trolley route all the way through to Everett, basically, though it's kind of hit or miss uh, where that trail actually is. But it is basically a, a safe and connected bike trail from roughly South Everett all the way down to right here at this spot. And this is where we're gonna be talking about, hi, we're gonna talk about what could happen uh, potentially in the future, what's planned already, and then what we can do to make it even better. Um, the idea of this ride is really how do we improve the interurban, bring more attention to it, and advocate to extend it all the way down to what I'm thinking is 83rd Street, pretty good location because that connects then to the Greenway that goes to Green Lake. And from Green Lake, you have a safe bike route all the way down to the Ship Canal and then through on West Lake to downtown. And then from there, downtown, you know, the ne bike network is growing and pretty soon there'll be a connected route all the way down to the Rainier Valley. And suddenly you could get from South Everett to Burien pretty easily, you know, that kind of thing, or to Renton. So a pretty, pretty decent connection. And the the missing gap, if you want to call it that, is right here where we're standing. This is the start of it. Okay, let's saddle up. We'll go down just to the intersection at 105th. Stop in the shade there. Are we going to cross this stop or are we going to stop before we cross? Before we cross. We'll stop before we cross. Thank you. How you doing, Chris? All right. Cannot complain on a day like today. Okay, so I'm passing around right now a uh, mailer that Estot sent out to people in this neighborhood and uh, the, the printout here on this side. It's of this intersection here, 105th and Fremont. Uh, as you can see, there's the barricade up like the healthy streets have. To make it permanent, they're gonna put in like a big concrete planter, right? Um, they're also gonna do a couple other things at this intersection because this is a, I don't know what they call it, protected intersection in a way. Uh, they don't allow cars to drive straight through on Fremont. They have to make a right or a left in, in both directions. Supposedly. Right. It's yeah. legally that's what it's supposed to do. Follow me from 85th to 104th. Yep. And I kept pointing that street clothes sign. Yeah. They don't care. Yeah. And, and to be fair, like, there's no reason why a car can't go straight through right now. Physically, they're able to, and there's no one's going to watch and stop them, no cops or anything. So what SI's planning to do, the improvement, if you take a look at the picture here, is actually, I think, going to be pretty effective. It's going to create a, a bike lane coming right at the car lane, which means the car cannot drive straight through because a car can't fit into a bike lane. The bike lane will be buffered on one side by the side of the street, the curb, and on the other side, a little median island, which will probably have a big sign that says cars don't enter, whatever. This is a, a healthy street. So, of course, a car could veer over a little bit into the... Uh, outgoing lane across from them, but that's a really awkward and obviously illegal movement. Right now, it's pretty straightforward. They can make that easy move into the street. So it should deter a lot more of the straight through uh, movements of the cars. However, turning movements left and right are still allowed, and the, um, the bikes uh, have, I don't know, like a eight, 10 second, bikes and pedestrians have an eight or 10 second uh, crosswalk uh, time at this intersection. Yeah, it's encouraging because it'll be further up. Like this sign yeah. is too far back, the cars just make this too Yeah. Weird. And they actually did that intentionally so that cars could like come in, pause here, while the exiting traffic leaves. It's like they're, they're bending over backwards for the cars and not thinking about the actual purpose of... Every street is required. Yeah. Give us something. Please. And even the bike lanes, like, well, how do we make sure cars can still go in these bike lanes? I mean, what are you doing? All right. So folks who have been watching these healthy streets in this neighborhood, definitely the neighbors around here have, um, would remember that 92nd Street was a greenway and then converted to a healthy street during the pandemic and was under review until late last year when SDOT decided, okay, the healthy streets in the neighborhood that are gonna be made permanent include Fremont and 100th and Ashworth over on the east side of Aurora. 92nd didn't make the cut, despite the fact that traffic 
data showed before and after the panda before and after the healthy street treatment, which is just orange barricades and a nice crossing at Aurora. Before and after, cars car volume went down, car speeds went down, it became a much nicer and safer place to bike. But SDOT said it wasn't enough of an improvement to justify making it permanent. It'll be just as effective as a greenway. Greenway meaning that barricade will go away at some point, maybe when next time it gets broken, they'll just take it away and not replace it. And then you just have that sign that says greenway. There's speed humps, to be fair, along 92nd, but that's basically all greenway is, is a sign and speed humps. A healthy street, on the other hand, is actually an improvement because you're putting a physical obstruction in front of cars that deters them from driving on the street, and if they do, they have to slow down at, some, at certain places. And what this street, this barricade is saying is, this street, 92nd, is closed. The big question, and I'm not sure how this will be treated, we need to talk with SDOT about it, but the big question is, well, if this healthy street, Fremont, is going to be extended, originally it stopped at 92nd, if it's going to be extended down to 87th, as we'll talk about, what's it going to look like coming up to here? Will there be a barricade saying, don't come to this street? Will it be down at that block saying, don't come onto this block because it's a dead end? These are the kind of questions I don't know if SDOT's thought through and what their plan is. I wouldn't be surprised if their plan was simply people just shouldn't drive and we won't do anything. We'll just leave it as it is. As it is, obviously, it's a very wide roadway. Cars can pass comfortably uh, against each other at speed. What we need, well, we'll talk about what we need when we come back north and the, and the improvements. But this is one of those uh, locations where the barricade, the orange barricades will be replaced with planters, or concrete posts and signs. But the question is where will they be placed and how will it direct traffic slash impede traffic to actually make it a slower and safer street. They have the uh, value tickets. All right, so this will be the end of the healthy street and by default, the end of the interurban. On this one, I'll pass this around. You can see two intersections, 88th, yeah, 88th and 89th streets. That's this here and that one up there. This was actually something that the Aurora Licton home zone uh, proposed or has included in the home zone improvements and that is extended curb bulbs at this intersection and that intersection to slow down a lot of the cut through traffic especially during rush hour will come speeding through here whipping around and trying to cut back over to 88th there um, or 87th there and they're really like we were talking about the diverter it's because people coming off of Aurora on 90th hit that diverter and either they know or they don't know and they're like where would I go now and they're now zooming through the neighborhood trying to make up lost time and they end up at either 89th or sometimes they go south to 88th but they end up right here at this park uh, boys and girls club right there a lot of kids in this area and people going really fast whipping through here so those improvements for a curb bulb at this location in 89th um, made it into the home zone plan and then the healthy street program said We'll take those, we'll do that as part of the healthy street and just extend the healthy street all the way to 87th. Or yeah, 87th basically right here, 88th, 87th. So that's good. Like SDOT has actually done something smart. They talked to one another and they said, we can do this. We can make it a, a complete route all the way to 87th. What we'll talk about next is, well, what about going four more blocks to 83rd? 
But the improvements here should help. Again, it's just paint and post. It's really nothing special, but it's gonna be something that visually tells cars, you gotta slow down here, there's people, and it should uh, make the, the crossing distance for anyone who's trying to cross from sidewalk to sidewalk a little bit better. <clears throat> Curb bulbs here too. Yeah. If this were to become a healthy street all the way down, the inner urban all the way down, that would yeah, be an I mean, easy. I think it makes more sense to extend it all the way down yeah. to the age third, where you can connect east west. Green. Yep. And it's one of those things that, like, they could say, oh, yeah, it's a good idea long term, we'll put that into the STP or into the next levy. It doesn't cost that much. Yeah. Like, find the, the spare bucks here and there. Vision Zero has it. Make it happen now. Yeah. Don't, don't leave this gap on the map for the next 10 years and make it a, an issue for bikers in yeah. North Seattle for another generation. Yeah, and that's what I was gonna talk about as well, not for this particular street, but Aurora. Yeah. Because some people seem to believe that we don't need bike lanes at this point. It can be added later, but I don't think it's gonna happen. We no. want, no. I mean, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Exactly. I want them to do it right. Exactly. So. <laughs> yeah, the idea that, oh, well, we'll just add that later, it won't. It won't happen. Yeah, I mean. It happens now, or it's going to be locked in for another 50 years at yeah. least. Yeah. Did we get everyone over? I think we did. All right, so this is the 83rd Street Greenway. If you go that direction, you'll get to uh, Green Lake Way and uh, Aurora. It's the kind of like a five-way diagonal intersection. You can take that Green Lake Way down at a diagonal and you'll hit the north end of Green Lake right at uh, Duke's Chowder House. So that direction, you get to Green Lake and it's protected bike lane. Uh, the whole way. It's a green lake. It's a greenway until 83rd, until Aurora, and then it turns into a bike lane. You go that direction. It's a greenway with now a safe crossing at 83rd and Greenwood. But that 83rd greenway is slated to continue past First Avenue Northwest and all the way eventually to 15th Avenue Northwest, potentially on on to um, 24th Northwest. So this 83rd Street greenway is going to be a pretty significant connector of Ballard. Crown Hill, Loyal Heights, all those folks to Green Lake and then from there further east. Ravenna Boulevard is a great connection further east. So there's a lot to be said for 83rd Street Greenway. What we're talking about though is the potential to make the connection of this major greenway and this major healthy street greenway trail as effective as possible. Right now you can see it's a it's a pretty decent uh, greenway, uh, similar to what we saw between um, 95th and 98th and 100th on Fremont further north. There's cars on both sides. It's pretty traffic calmed. Uh, but technically, it is not part of the interurban, and it does not, it's not part of the healthy street, the Fremont Avenue healthy street. That ends at 88th. So there's no improvements planned for this section from 83rd to 88th. And this is where we start to talk about, well, how do we make it better? How do we actually finish this connection, make the interurban trail a complete, all ages and abilities, complete bike trail. Uh, we call it a trail-like experience. So obviously the urban's great. At 110th, you're onto a trail. There's no one else around. Pedestrians and bikes mixing. It's nice. It's like the Burke Gilman. It's the Burke Gilman of the north. But then when you get south of 110th, it's no longer such a comfortable trail-like experience. And that's what we want to talk about. How do we make it a trail-like experience and how do we connect it to other important uh, bike network places like 83rd Street, 92nd Street, and others?
Yeah. Well, my wife is more insistent on speaking Japanese. I'm kind of flexible. Yeah. A mural, I think, in the middle would be a really great way to connect the trail. What I also was thinking just the other day, and this is especially true north of 105th, we should just get the green bike lane paint down the middle. If this is a bike route, cars can drive on it, obviously they're able to, but let's give them as much notice as possible. Cars are not supposed to be on the street. If you are not local traffic, get the hell off. And there's so much space, especially north of uh, 100th, because there's no curbs, that you could easily have the bike path in the middle and people driving would feel like, oh, I gotta get over to the right side of this green green lane and right, drive slowly on the right side. I think it would slow down traffic quite a bit. Yeah. Not a designation, but like a specific... An improvement, yeah. And I think definitely there is going to be justification for something in the future. But I feel like right now, it's actually effectively a pretty safe street to go bike on. So if you advocated for something... Are you willing to let it go down 92nd? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Until they do. Yeah, and that's one of the issues is that 92nd is not a official crossing guard location. 90th is. Yeah. Not, not to say that there actually is going to be a crossing guard there because they are understaffed, have been for years. But theoretically, if you had a crossing guard at 92nd, it could be a lot safer for kids, especially from random people who are just there on the side of the road. It happens all the time on Aurora. But without a crossing guard, yeah, you're right. The kids are at the mercy of whatever they come against. against. Yeah. Uphill and the speed dif differential. Yeah. The driver is going to be tempted. Exactly. Uh, and that's the thing. It's a greenway. It should be effectively called like a healthy street, except that SDOT's abdicating responsibility on the greenways. And it does have sidewalks, but it has driveways with bad sight lines, too. So. Yeah. All right, let's stop right here. So you can see there's one orange barrel still here. Or there's two. There's two. There, oh wait, no, there's three. That one's gone. That's the only one that's gone. Yeah, way down there. But this intersection theoretically should have one at each corner, which was actually one of the more common complaints when SDOT did outreach on this healthy street. A lot of neighbors, not a lot, some neighbors, a few, said it's confusing when you pull up this intersection, there's nowhere to go because every road is closed which is surprising because people clearly don't understand that your car can still go even when a sign says don't. Yeah, it's just low for access only. So yeah. That means you can't go. Yeah, it's maybe, a dis maybe that's the thing rather than the closed street, lo local access yeah, only. Yeah, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, words, street closed, local access only, I think it's a disingenuous argument they were making. They just wanted to complain about it to get the barrels sure. off the street. Yeah. It, in the end, people know you can go around the barrel if you live here and you have a reason to go there. But, What's going to happen is, uh, if you want to look at the diagram again, SDOT's kind of standard implementation of these healthy street planters is to put a planter here, a planter here, leave about, I think it's like a 12 foot lane for big trucks to go through, uh, wide enough for that, but not wide enough for two cars to pass. But planters at both sides, pinch point, and that's, that's what you do at each intersection on a healthy street. This is a unique place though, because we have intersection after intersection after intersection. You don't see that on First Avenue Northwest. You don't see it on any other, most of the other uh, healthy streets. So this is gonna be an interesting way to implement it. You're gonna see a lot of planters. It's kind of effective here, but also, I don't know, there might be a better way to implement a healthy street calming uh, with the planters. I mean, I think diverting cars on the blocks 
the other block, so like then this street actually is effectively less has less cars on it right now. Even those planters on first, you know, people there's there's still traffic on those streets. Yeah. It's interesting though, if you were to put like the barrels there and not have them here, which is the case now, at least there, it leaves this intersection wide open and it really doesn't feel as protected, right? Imagine, obviously these barrels are just barrels right now, but imagine if you had six plant, or eight planters, two, 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 two. It's gonna feel a little more closed in and comfortable for people biking and walking. Yeah, let's cross over and we'll meet under the tree, same place. One thought I had for this intersection before Estad had their idea of the, the pinch point that would essentially be like here, I think, something like that. If you look down this way, you have the cemetery, yeah. no entrances, nothing. Yeah. And down this way, you have uh, just one house, I think, one property. <clears throat> no driveway until you get down basically to the corner. If you go down that way, it curves about half a block away from here. It would be so simple and incredibly cheap. Get some of those eco blocks over there, put them right here. That's it. Just stop. Just stop. It's a dead end. You put the sign down there, it says dead end. People coming through here, dead end. You maintain parking. People park here a lot to go use the trail. You maintain this parking. If anything, you expand parking for people that want to use the trail and you make it a lot safer for everyone coming in and out of the trail. Why do people use this street again? Yeah. Because they see a sign over there at 109th and North Park Avenue that says street closed ahead. Ah. So they veer off this way. Oh, I see. Yeah, Even though they could go that way. Yeah, right. okay. It means they'd have to use the arterial if they're very Exactly. That's the idea that we should be proposing proposing for every single part of the city is keep people in arterials, keep them out of the neighborhoods. That barrel over there apparently seems to do that, but it's diverting them over to this street. You close this street, I don't know where they go, but I hope they go onto the arterial and not come into the neighborhood to cut through, which they're all doing. If you watch cars here, they're just constantly cutting through and going straight on to Greenwood. It's just a roar to Greenwood, that's all they're doing.
The inner urban itself, pretty nice. Like I said, it's Seattle City Light right of way property. And the art that you saw, those signs like change as you go down, that was part of the arts, 1% for the arts, which is like a program that the city has been doing for decades now where any major project, I, I forget the amount, like over 50 million, something like that, you have to put 1% of the project budget towards art. And that's the art they made. <clears throat> I don't know what year it was, I think 2008 or something, the signs say. Uh, and you'll notice as you go along here, the, the fence line to the cemetery on the other side here is broken down. A lot of openings. There's official openings as well for people to go into the cemetery. And something I didn't know until I actually talked to the cemetery folks a couple months ago, they want us in there. Like it is not bad to bike through there, to use it as a cut through route to get to somewhere further east or west, <clears throat> to walk your dog, to just hang out. Like it's a public space and they actually encourage people to go in there and use it as such. Um, No one, they didn't mention it to me. There's the groundskeeper and like the, the community liaison person who I was talking to and both of them like, yeah, come use it, we don't care. So for that reason, um, the Aurora Reimagined Coalition is working with them to try to site a greenway through the cemetery on the east side of Aurora. That's a whole other conversation for another day. <clears throat> but in that conversation I had with the cemetery people, we talked about this surface right here, the mausoleum. This is on the other side of this is the mausoleum. This is obviously, an eyesore, there's graffiti. And when I suggested, hey, maybe we could do a mural there sometime, they said, oh, please, because we keep getting fines from the city. Every time it gets graffitied, they're required to come out and do graffiti abatement, you know, paint over it, which takes time, money, and more importantly, if they don't do it in a certain amount of time, the city then fines them. So they're sitting here looking at this like it's an eyesore, we don't like it, we don't want to keep dealing with it. If someone were to paint something on it, maybe there'd be less graffiti in the future and it'd be easier for us. So they are 100% on board with us doing a mural. The question is, what do we want to do and how much time and volunteer energy do we have to, to make it happen? This year, probably too late. But there's already been some talk about doing like a, a mural design competition with art students at North, Se North Seattle College. <clears throat> take the winning design and get, get uh, volunteers, neighbors to come out and paint it over the course of a couple days with uh, guidance from the official like art person. Because North Seattle College has a mural painting like class. <clears throat> My wife knows the teacher, so it's like easy connection. But if we were going to do that, one, what do we want to paint? How complicated will it be? How expensive will it be to get all the supplies? And two, we got to clear out a lot of brush here and even maybe some dirt. You can see there's like dirt coming up where it's not supposed to. A lot of these gutters are not functioning. That's why you see that nasty spewage down the side. The gutters are just gone. So I feel like this would be part of a much bigger project with mural painting, uh, vegetation cleanup, and also the just fixing of some of the, the infrastructure on this building. But that's something we can work with the, the cemetery to do. I'm sure they would put some money towards that. And then the city has grant opportunities, 50K easily can be obtained to do this. So it's very real. The question is, do people want that to happen? Is that any other ideas? Oh. So this intersection, not great. People move pretty fast down the hill. You can see there's a button there for bikes. You can pull up really easily and press it. And then straight across, another button. That's not the right side. It should be on the other side of the trail. That's frustrating. Forrest, you were the first one to notice this. What happened? Nothing. I tested S dot whatever year they put it in. Yeah, I, I didn't even yeah, I press the button just because I like more flashing things for the cars to see, but <laughs> it's not necessary all the time. I think I think long term they're going to in the bike master plan or the Seattle transportation plan now I think they are going to put in protective bike lanes along 125th but that could be a decade from now. Yeah. It's in the plan I think. <clears throat> I have to say the signal light, the lights are a huge improvement from, and, yeah. and they've cut back on some of the, the Blackberry were 
all over and it was really hard to even see what was yeah. going on. Um, just so people know, 128th is going to be is eventually a crosswalk, safe crossing over Aurora. Um, if you go just right up there, you can see it, that stop sign way up on the trail. That's 128th. Uh, Aurora is going to get this summer, oh, thank you, um, a turn restriction. So people can't make a left onto 128th. And then eventually the idea is that will also become a bike pedestrian crossing, no car crossing. But for now, 128th is a greenway that could connect from the inner urban here all the way over to First Avenue Northeast and then to the light rail station at 130th, which is great, but it's going to be an uphill battle because Chick-fil-A is at 128th in Aurora and they are notorious for having a lot of traffic come through the drive through um, and just circle the block and go all the way 128th to Linden and then back again. So Chick-fil-A? Like five years ago.